The book of John is truly apologetic in that it defends and affirms the deity of King Jesus the Christ. It also is written to generate obedient faith and that you and I can have not only the abundant life, John 10 and verse 10, but in the life to come. In Mark 10 and verse 30, now in this life, ye will receive 100 fold and in the world to come, eternal life. We have all of this here and heaven too. It comes through the Christ of glory. With that in mind, turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. It's amazing that when we look at the 14th chapter or when we look at the book of John, the inspired writer, he takes out of 879 verses, only two, to show us the very purpose of John's writings. Out of that one chapter, when we talk about chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, we see 20 words in verse number 30, and we see 27 in verse 31. That's 47 words out of the 19,099 in the book that he gives us to pinpoint the purpose of his writing. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Verse 20. Notice verse 21. But these are written that you might believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have a life through his name. There is many other things that Jesus did in his three and a half years of public ministry that is not contained in this book. I realize the last words of chapter 21 is in a metonymous type way. There would not be volumes that can contain what Jesus did. But let's resonate that just for a moment. When we think of the largest two libraries that's known to man, British, and also the Library of Congress, in excess of 173 million volumes, when we place that back into John 21, and you think about the things that are not written in this book, but these are written. What is he talking about? In chapter 2, when he turned water into wine, these are written. What are you talking about? In chapter 4, we read about he healed that nobleman's child. In chapter number 5, that man that had been impotent for 38 years in the first nine verses. We have that contained. In chapter 6, that's written when he took two fish, five barley loaves of bread, and fed 5,000. In that same chapter, we read about Jesus Christ walking on water. In chapter number 9, the man had been blown blind, and Jesus gave him sight. In chapter number 11, he raised up Lazarus from the dead. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I need to point something out to you. Because when we read that in the English, I know you don't see the word faith there, but truly it's there in the language. Oh, yes, it is. You won't see the English word faith there, but it's in the language, pistuo. We're talking about love conjoined with trust and obedience. 
That's what's there. When I read about Paul's first evangelistic thrust in Acts 13, Acts 14, show me one time where the word baptism is mentioned. But neighbor is there. It's there. So just because we don't see F-A-I-T-H, it's in John, neighbor. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now we have the purpose. Now let's look at John chapter number 14. In the 14th chapter of the book of John, we see this particular verse. I perhaps have heard this verse more in my life at funerals. And oh, when a denominational person get their hands on it. They say all kinds of things. But let's look at the text in its contextual setting. Now, I'm not going to do you like Eric Owens did. He walked through seven chapters. I only have five. <laughs> Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? <laughs> the context actually starts in chapter 13. And it goes to chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and chapter 17. These five chapters are only one night of King Jesus of Christ's life. These five chapters. When he's up in the upper room, these five chapters. In chapter number 13, even if I just want to give you something to chew on here. In chapter 13, let's see what's going on. In the 13th chapter of the book of John, what you're going to have in 13, verse number 1, and forward. What you're going to have there, that Jesus Christ is going to teach a lesson of humility. That's what's going on there. Then when you get to chapter number 13, all the way to chapter 13 and verse number 30, what you're going to have there, you're going to have somebody is going to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then when you get to 30 through 35, there's going to be a new commandment that's going to be given. Then in chapter 13, verses 36 through the end of that chapter, verse 38, we're going to see somebody is going to deny Jesus Christ. Now just hold it right there. If I was to give you in an alliterated fashion, I will use as a memory tool the alphabet F, and I will show you the firstborn. The firstborn flight and his followers faith. That's why I explained that word because I was going to use it there. We see that in chapter 13. The firstborn's flight and his followers' faith. Now when we come to chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, we will see the firstborn future and his followers, that is the firstborn's future and his followers' faith. F-A-T-E. We see that in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Then in chapter 14, verses 3 through 6, we see the firstborn for a tale and his followers for a thought. Now that's the context so far. Now let's look at my responsibility on tonight. The passage says, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's what I am assigned there. When I think about that beginning, this echo I mean construction here, I am 
We realize and recognize that even in the Old Testament. You remember over there in Genesis 17, 1. Here God is talking to Abram, getting ready and have given him some information. In chapter 17 and verse 1, after you follow me completely, the word perfect there in the King James Version, I am the Almighty. When I look at that in Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through verse number 14, well, when after you get through that personal section, that prep work, God tells Moses to go down and tell somebody, my people go. Pharaoh says, after that blasphemous statement in Exodus 5 and verse 2, who is this Lord? There's only one God in Egypt. And the one you're talking about, Moses, is not him. Who is this Lord that I should obey his voice? And as a result of that, you go down there and tell him, I am that I am. We usually call that or refer to that as the tetra, grammaton. I am that I am. In Exodus 15 and verse number 26, hear God speaking to Moses. And he tell Moses, I am he that hear it be. When I look at that 8th century in Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah chapter 61, particularly 41 and verse number 4, Isaiah says, I am the first. I am with the last. I can hear the inspired penman John in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 11, that cross-reference. I am Alpha Omega. The beginning, the end, first and the last. When I go to that seventh century in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3 and verse number 12, Jeremiah, and that overlapped some 70 years between him and Isaiah. They are preaching to this group of people, trying to get them to know you're going into Babylonian captivity, but you're going to come out. And in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, and verse number 12, what did Jeremiah say? Return, O backslide in Israel, said the Lord, for I am merciful. When I look at the book of Psalms, in Psalm 35, and verse number 3, I am thy salvation. So when I look at, in the New Testament, when I see I am Neighbor, the word I, first of all, it's emphatic. It's emphatic. I am. We are dealing with something that is divine, as Brother Owens has already stipulated. So when I look at I am, number one, the way. Let's see what we can get out of that. I am. The way. How interesting it is when we see this. I am. There are some things that already has happened in that upper room. There has been a discussion. Jesus has already told them in chapter 13, verses 33 and verse number 36. I'm going to leave you. In chapter 1, I'm going to leave you. All the way down through the book of John, he reminds them he's going to leave them. We also see when he makes that statement, the apostles were offended at him. Not only that, he also makes the statement in Luke 22 that there is strife that is among you. That's the reason why he gave that new commandment after exemplifying himself with all of the humbleness and all of the humility and washing their feet. So we see there is something that's going on after he instituted the Lord's Supper. So now, when well, he says, I am the way, not one of many ways, in order for us to identify that, 
Let's look at something real quickly. In Acts chapter 9, verse number 2. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 19, verse 9. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. Acts chapter 22 and verse 22. Acts chapter 24. All the way out to the book. Let's see this word. Say this word. I am. Christ says, I am the way. Well, let's nail that down. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 beginning. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of priests. Now, notice how inspiration got it. There is one body, one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope or you're called it. One, one faith, one baptism, one God. You got three on both sides. Neighbor, right in the middle, there is one Lord. And I believe that's intentional, neighbor. Because if not the one Lord, the whole thing falls. We only have one Lord. We only have one teaching. There can only be one way. We practice that all the time when we operate in motor vehicles, do we not? When we talk about all of the interstates that are surrounding us, the longest interstate, some 3,400 miles, is interstate what? 90. It runs east and west from Boston, Massachusetts. All the way to Seattle, Washington. Now, Fred, 80 is the second longest. I know it goes from San Francisco all the way to Connect, New Jersey. Then we think about 40. Or we think about Interstate 10. Starts in Jacksonville. All the way to Santa Monica, California. Or I-95. That's a good one from Miami, and runs completely out of the United States. A 65 starts in Mobile, go all the way to Gary, Indiana. So we understand way. A person can be honest. A person can be sincere or whatever, they want, whatever word they want to choose. And if you get on one interstate trying to go east and you're going west, you might be on the right road, but you're just going the wrong way. I realize there's a whole lot of sincere people on the right, but they're going the wrong way. We have to get on the right road, and we have to go the right way, and that's through King Jesus the Christ. We need King Jesus the Christ. Come with me, neighbor. You can mark that down. And so many people are ignoring King Jesus today. That's why the cause of this world has blinded. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3 has blinded the minds of men. We recognize that denominationalism. Take the same passage. Teach all kinds of stuff on it. I hasten to emphasize some of my brethren are blind. They may not be 100% blind yet, but they got a bad case of glaucoma. We have to look at God Almighty. That's where we get our authority from, from the teachings of Scripture. And when he says, I am the way, not one of many ways, but I am the way, not because of my feelings. 
I am the way. The Bible doesn't, neighbor, the Bible doesn't deal in guesswork. You can mark that down. The Bible doesn't deal in assumptions. You can mark that down. Luke wrote of a surety, wherein the things that thou hast been instructed. Luke 1, 3, and 4. If any man wills to do God's will, he shall know the teachings. You can make your calling and election sure. Listen to me carefully, friend. Conscience is not a safe guide. Oh, no, it's not. Unless conscience is safely guided by the word of Almighty God. We don't go to our medicine cabinet at night getting something for eye drops, and this might be a, a nose medicine, do we? It's not the fact that the road is wrong that we might be traveling, as long as we feel like we're on the right road. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah said, Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to the right his steps. Proverbs 16, 25. Proverbs 14 and 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man. It looks right. It thinks right. It feels right. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I read about a man in Genesis 37. This man in Genesis 37, there was his son. They went down to Burleson Coat Factory, and they got a coat of many colors. They dipped it into some kid's blood and brought it back to their father. You know what their father said? My son been killed by a wild beast. Jacob says, I'm going to go to my grave weeping over the death of my boy. And neighbor for 22 years. Jacob believed that lie. 22 years. He believed that lie. Would his feelings have been any different if the boy was dead? You see, feelings is not a safe guide. You know why? Because you might have been given some wrong information. And when that caravan came, you know what he says? Oh, my boy's alive. You've heard the story about the husband and wife was arguing about whether or not the one, 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 the, that the one ought to be up or down. The wife said, I think that one ought to be up. I suffocate when it's down. The man said, I think the one ought to be down. I freeze when it's up. She lowered, he rose, she a lowered, he raised, she a lowered, he raised, and she lowered it for the same time. That man on a fiddle of anger jumped out of bed, grabbed a chair, and threw it, and glass went everywhere. And the very next morning, before the break of day, the wife said, you know what? I never enjoyed a more peaceful, oxygenated life in all my life. The man said, you did? I nearly froze to death. But when they turned on the window, the window when they turned on the light, the window was still down. But the mirror next to it was smashed all the pieces. Feelings is not a safe guide, neighbor. Conscience is not a safe guide. We have this book. That brings us to the next. I am the truth. I am the truth. Let's walk down through the book of John. We look at John 1 and verse 14. We look at John 1 and verse 17. Law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We look at John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The undergirding line is unity. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about unity. He's preparing his disciples to go into all the world. Teach all nations. That's what he is doing here. But between Pentecost, there is the cross, neighbor. No wonder he says, let not your heart be troubled. You know what's so interesting about that to me? Because when we look at that word trouble, that present imperative. We know what present tense is. But I want you to look at that sometime. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find the negative hooked up to it. 
is a present imperative with a negative. What are you talking about? Jesus Christ has already told them the time is going to come when men are going to put you to death. And in, do, in so doing, they think they're doing God a service. John 16, 1 and 3. He already have told them about trouble and about persecution. That's not what he's talking about when he's talking about this word trouble here. What he is talking about, there is something that's already going on here, and you need to stop it. Check it out sometimes. You need to stop it. Let not your heart be troubled. What you weeping for? What you weeping for? It's amazing how denominational people think you're supposed to stir up people's emotions, especially at funerals. Instead of trying to diffuse that, people are already hurt. And that's just not what Jesus Christ is talking about there. You look at it. There is already something that's going on, all of the things that are listed for you, all of the strife that is among them. There is one that is among them that's going to betray them, one that is among them going to deny them. All of this stuff is going on here. And now they are weeping out of control. They are so discouraged. And Jesus says, what are you weeping for? If you believe in God. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In this same book of John, when you look at Jesus' neighbor, you see God, John 14, 9. If you've known Jesus, you've known God, John 8, 19. To receive Jesus is to receive God, Mark 9, 37. To honor Jesus is to honor God, John 5, 23. I and my father are one neighbor. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house are is enough room. I'll just say it like that so won't nobody get confused. He's not talking about a room for the Baptist, a room for the Methodist, a room for the Muslim. That's not what he's talking about in that text. There's enough room for everybody in my father's house. If it were not so, 1 Samuel 15, 29, Prince of Israel cannot lie. If it were not so, Numbers 23, 19, He's a God that he shouldn't like. If it's not so, Hebrews 6 and verse 18, that's two immutable things, it's impossible to God to lie. If it's what not so, Titus 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. If it was not true, I would have told you. Listen to the record. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Let me explain that to you. Jesus Christ is not talking about hiring some construction company, Dudley down the street there, and going up in heaven and build a building. That's not what he's talking about in that text. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to make ready. I'm going to the cross. That's what he's talking about. No cross, no heaven. I'm going to make ready. I, am, I got to go to the cross. That's what he's talking about. In the book of beginning, God's name is mentioned 32 times in 31 verses. Out of those 31 times, 10 times he says, and God said, and God said, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast by the breath of his mouth. He is talking about going to the cross to be crucified. And without the cross, nobody can get to heaven, neighbor. I'm going to make ready. And then notice what he says after Thomas asked that question. Here is the answer. Verse 4 to verse 6. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And then he says this. I am the light. We stress baptism, but baptism is not a and baptism is not a graduation, I should correctly say. It's a commencement. 
is not the end. It's just a means to an end. It's the beginning of a godly life. The Apostle Paul says it best. If Jesus Christ is the life, Acts 17, 28 and 29, in him we live. Neighbor, that's present tense. We move, that's continuing tense. And have our very being, future tense. What are we talking about? I am the life. Let me give you this illustration here. In Philippians 1 and verse number 21, the Apostle Paul says, For to me to live is Christ. Then Paul says, and to die is gain. Part of me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I've broke for a lot of years to wonder if Paul had been standing preaching those words to me or teaching those words to me. What shades of meaning could Paul bring out, neighbor, that we really don't see when we read it? If Paul was standing right here tonight preaching those words to us, what shades of meaning could he bring out that we really don't see when we read it? Maybe using certain elocutions, inflections of voice. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. You know why? Because to Paul, his life was Christ dated, Christ devoted, Christ directed, giving you some deeds. His life was Christ dated, Christ devoted, and Christ directed. When Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, let me give you some seeds. His, his life was Christ centered. Christ's conscience and Christ's control. Jesus says, I am the life. We have to allow Christ to be the intent and the content of every one of our thoughts. Christ has to be at the center and at the circumference of every footstep that we make. Christ got to be the model and the monarch for our example. We got to let Christ be the source of our thinking, the cause of our thinking, the force of our thinking. Christ, every single solitary thing, every single reference to life, it had better be connected to Christ, neighbor. I'm talking about government. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about home. I'm talking about education. I'm talking about gender. It better be connected to Christ. He's the source of life, neighbor. You can mark that down. Paul says, for the me to live is Christ. And you know something interesting about that since I got that in, out up here? You know, if you take the word Christ out, because if there's no Christ in life, there's no gain in death. Let me just erase that right there. If there's no Christ in life, neighbor, there's no gain in death. And if you take out the word Christ and gain, you got to take out the word and and ill, and all you got left in that statement. That's all you got left in that statement. For to me to live is to die, because that's all life is without Christ, neighbor. It's just a struggle from the cradle to the grave. You see, with Christ, life is a message, but without Christ, life is nothing but a mess. With Christ, you add life to yields, but without Christ, you simply add yields to life. With Christ, life is an endless hope, but without Christ, neighbor, life is nothing but a hopeless end. Everything is connected to King Jesus the Christ. He is our ultimate example. He's already given the example that he's the ultimate example. And I know we mock them. The Apostle Paul says we mock them. Paul says we imitate him, and, and, uh, we follow him, imitate him, uh, uh, as he imitate Christ. I know that, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul says, in, in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 7 through 9, Paul says the same identical thing. In Philippians 3, 17, Paul says the same thing, and he said it more than once. 
but Christ is our ultimate example. I know we have great, great men of God and women of God and beautiful, beautiful children that God has given us in the gifts of our, our, our children and our grandchildren. God is good, isn't he? Give us these beautiful gifts. And, and here we are. We have great parents, but Christ is our ultimate example. He's the one suffered, leaving us an example that we must follow in his footsteps. Paul knew that. Paul knew Christ was greater than parents. Matthew 10, 32, 38 to 40. Paul knew Christ was greater than Jonah. <laughs> Matthew 12, 41. Or greater than Solomon. Matthew 12, 42. Paul knew Christ was greater than Elijah. Matthew 17, 5. Paul knew Christ was greater than the angels. Hebrews 1 and verse 4. Paul knew Christ was greater than Moses. Hebrews 3, 2 forward. Paul knew Christ was greater than Abraham. Hebrews chapter 6. Paul knew Christ was greater than Joshua. Hebrews chapter 3. Paul knew Christ was greater than Aaron. Hebrews chapter 4. Paul knew Christ was greater than the prophets. John chapter 8 and verse 53. Paul knew Christ was greater than David. Acts chapter 2, 22 forward. Paul knew Christ was greater than life itself. 1 Kings 4. Verses 24 to 32. No wonder Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Now, let me give you some examples. One or two practical applications to what we're talking about. Jesus Christ says, I am. Without question, we're talking about something that is divine. Without question, we're talking about something that is distinct. There is no one like King Jesus the Christ. And it's also demanding that comes through obedience. What are you talking about here? We have the example set before us. that We're going to be the light. In order for us to be that light, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I got to walk like Christ, talk like Christ. Live like Christ, act like Christ, have the mind of Christ. No wonder Paul says, I'm crucified with, notice that beautiful preposition, I'm with Christ, or dead with Christ, Colossians 2 and 20, buried with Christ, Romans 6 and verse 3, raised with Christ, verse 4, if you did be risen with Christ, Colossians 3, 1 beginning. We can change the preposition, can't we? Christ living in me. Notice the I in now. A 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If the man be in Christ. I know we don't study that much. That's not a challenge to an I in. I'm not going to study that. But let me tell you something, friend. That preposition denotes three things. It denotes a position of privilege. It describes a profession and neighbor. It determines a practice. That little preposition. In Christ, that means something. Let this mind be in you. Secondly, I'm going to have the mind of Christ walk like and talk like and live like. I must become a complete replica of King Jesus. He already warned the disciples there's going to be persecution. Paul warned you and me. In Philippians 1, 29, we not only must believe on the neighbor, we must suffer for his sake. In Acts 14 and verse 22, with much tribulation, they entered into the kingdom. 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, all that are live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Now listen to it. In the remaining moments of my time, let me give you some H's. And we just do that for our students. It helps us to easily remember our outline. That's all it is. And in your homiletical classes, I know you've been taught that. Because I certainly taught you that when I was teaching here. 
It just helps you remember what you got to do. By imitation, I'm going to show you the heavenly house. Just using the alphabet H. Then there is hope for the heathen. But neighbor, there's a highway home. It most certainly is. Jesus Christ has already given us not to allow anything to stop us from being faithful, dedicated, devoted to God Almighty. You've already did that. How often we read that passage, if you didn't be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Well, Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you died your life is here with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life shall be manifest, then shall you also be manifested with him in glory. Go to the airport, catch an airplane. When you're out there on that tarmac, everything is the same. But you know what, friend? The further you go up, the smaller the things look on the ground. It's not that the things on the ground has miraculously shrunk. It's that now you're looking at them from a different viewpoint. And when we have the difficulties that God says is going to come in this life, if we are allowing them to make us stop, make us quit, you better try to change your view, neighbor. You still on the ground because the closer you get to God, the smaller your problems are to you. You know why? I'm working for heaven, neighbor. I'm trying to get to heaven. That's what I'm trying to get. And so, therefore, we don't allow our hearts to be troubled. There's three things right up under that head. I got a new peace now. I got a new place. And I got a new promise. When I say I got a new peace, Jesus Christ has given us that. In that John 14 and verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give with you. Neighbor, Jesus is our peace, isn't it? Ephesians 4, 2, 14. He made peace. Ephesians 2, 15. Jesus preached peace. Ephesians 2, 17. His kingdom is a kingdom of peace. Romans 14, 17. His gospel is a gospel of peace. Romans 10, 15, Ephesians 6, 15. His God is a God of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1 and verse 20. He's called the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. He will keep you in a perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3. He came to bring light to those that sit in darkness. God, their feet in the way of peace. Luke 1, 79. No wonder when I read John 14, 1. John 14, 27. Even though that's a part of this life, we sing that song. All those songs that deal with what you and I have to go through and live as Christians. But neighbor, we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And then the place. We're talking about heaven. That's what we're talking about. Jesus Christ have laid the groundwork for us to follow. Not only has laid that groundwork, he has given us the truth. I read over there in Acts 4, verses 4 and 5. When the local magistrates had accosted Peter and those preaching brethren, by what name, by what power you've done this? Done what? In order for me to get that answer, I got to go all the way back to chapter 3. They had healed that lame man. Peter did not stretch his head. What do you mean authority? Don't you know this is a free country? Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, let me tell you something. People today, especially in denominationalism, they do not understand that they have no authority from God to advance any religious idea. There is not a man alive got the authority to advance any religious idea. That come from God Almighty. And men go out and start all of this stuff, start all these denominations, start all these different teachings. 
Oh, don't you know it's a free country, shepherd? What did Peter say? This is the stone that set at no of your builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation. Acts 4, 10 to 12. What does that mean? Neighbor, there is no other authority figure. That's what it means. Well, so whatever you do in word or in deed, that doesn't just get my religious worship. That's anything I do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of or by the authority of King Jesus the Christ. So now we have the authority of the Christ of glory. He left that in chapter 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth comes. In chapter 16, he will guide you into A-double-L. All oh, truth. But he will not speak of himself. For whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Brothers and sisters, that was demonstrated through miraculous activity. And now, all of that stuff has been written down. When the testimony of an eyewitness, my brother Peter said, in his epistles, the testimony of an eyewitness has been reduced to writing. It was unrefuted in that day and generation. And since then, no new and conclusive proof have come about to say Peter was lying, or James was lying, or John was Oh, I better ask this question. Do you know of anybody that's living today was back there when Jesus lived? Peter was. John was, we got the testimony of an eyewitness. That testimony of an eyewitness, it has been reduced to writing. That writing was, is now unrefuted. It was unrefuted in that day and generation. No new and conclusive proof have arose up. So that testimony, it stands for all future time. It's amazing to me. That new revelation had to be demonstrated by miraculous activity. Oh, yes, it did. And that's what I ask. When brethren come up with all of this new stuff, all this new innovation, the only way you can prove it to me, I want to see you do a miraculous act. That's the only way you can prove it, neighbor. That's the only way you can prove it. Any innovation you name, whether it's hand clapping, whether it's humming, whether it's making mechanical sounds with your mouth, whether, whether it's strategic microphones placed everywhere, and all of that other stuff, can you prove it by miraculous act? That's what my Bible teach me, neighbor. New revelation has to be proven. And I read in Revelation 22, 21, you know what it says? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If you want to get something in the Pensacola newspaper, you got to have it in there the day before at 12 o'clock. If you one minute after 12, you got to wait, neighbor. And anything after Revelation 22, 21, it's just too late for the press. Press closed down. All that new stuff. We love you. We appreciate it. But here we have, we are trying to get to heaven. If you're not a Christian, there is only one way to get there. Only one way. Jesus Christ, he lets us know that way. When he says, I am the way. I am the way. That definite article, B, it stresses everything. I am the way. I am. As Brother Eric says, every time you see it, you're going to see he italicized. Oh, yes. John 8, verse 24, before John 8, verse 20, you believe that I am. You will die in your sins if you don't believe that. What are you talking about? Everything Jesus Christ that did. What are you talking about? All of that stuff in the Old Testament, except or unless you believe that I am. 
John 8 and 58, before Abraham was, I was. Neighbor Noah could have said that. Noah could have said, before Abraham was, I was here. Before Abraham was, I am present. That's why Micah 5 and verse 2 says it's going forth, have been from old and from everlasting. That's why John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Halagos. Not the Ramah, but the Halagos. Whichever pronunciation you prefer, the Erasmus of the modern. And the Halagos was with God. As Eric said, they had a coexistence. We talking about the incarnate Christ that has came down to make a way for us from earth to glory. That way you got to adhere to the teachings of scripture, neighbor. You got to adhere to the teachings of scripture. We can't be like those hard-headed Pharisees when Jesus Christ had to let them know search the scriptures for in them. They thought because they had the very possession of the scriptures. In Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, because God had given them the oracles, they thought that salvation had been achieved. I don't need Jesus. I'm already a child of God. My mother's a Jew. My father's a Jew. I'm a child of God by generation. Not so. Maybe you got to be R.E. You got to be regenerated in this thing. You got to come through Jesus Christ. He's the one that died on the cross for us. And that one way we have to travel through the church of Christ. We have to travel through that. Now, if you are not a Christian, don't have time for that word, do we? That prefix and suffix, I belong to, I am a follower of Christ. If we are following Christ, neighbor, we follow his teachings. He's the one said, uh, you ought to repent or perish. The application now, you better turn or burn. You can flip or you, you can fry, one or the other. Then Jesus Christ says, if you don't confess me before men, then will I confess. I will not confess before my Father which is in heaven. And then, neighbor, you got to allow your body to be immersed in water, predicated upon the teachings of Scripture, not retroactively, but predicated upon the teachings of Scripture. You allow your body to be immersed in water in order that your sins may be forgiven. So many people say, well, I've been baptized. You have? Well, there's a whole lot of us have gone underwater swimming when we were children. But we can, I got permission to go to that Tom Bigby River and swim from my mom and daddy, not from God Almighty. I can't use that baptism now to say, okay, now since I went up under the water, that's all right. Absolutely not. It is when you hear the word of God, the story of the cross, you submit to that teaching. And neighbor, then you allow your body to be immersed in water in order that your sins might be forgiven. Baptism is not an end, it's just a means to an end. It's the beginning of the life that Jesus Christ wants us to live. We urge you, we plead with you, if you're not a Christian, you need to be baptized. You need to be immersed in water. Why not do it while we sing? Please be seated. Brother David, stay right there. Do you, you know Lamb of God? You know the song, Lamb of God? Brother Braden does. We want to sing at least one or two verses, no more, probably two verses of that to close. Amber T came and asked me, could we sing a few extra songs? We've been here all day. I know people are tired. I said no. And then my wife said, my wife said, could we sing an extra song? So we're going to sing an extra song. <laughs> You'll understand that power one day, Amber. Brother Shepherd, thank you so much for that lesson. I don't know if you, I'm, I don't know how much you study history. I wish you could see the scene I'm seeing tonight. The people, I, they're everywhere. I mean, the Lord's Church was the fastest growing organization in the world. And it wasn't even close in the first century. 
Read the book of Acts. The Lord's Church was the fastest growing religious organization in the United States after World War II. Just study history. You also could, I skipped really the mid-1800s, it was growing like crazy all over this country. Denominational people were being converted. Simply, we members of the church were simply saying, let's just follow the Bible, only the Bible, all of the Bible. Don't add names, creeds, ideas. That's your passage, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. How, how simple is this concept? I have a friend of mine, he's a member of the Baptist Church, and one time we were talking about these things. He said, Jason, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. He agreed with, with, with it. And I said, yes, I said, but, but your, your group's not doing everything. They're doing many things right, but not all of the things. That we, I said, well, get rid of the name that's not in the Scripture and get rid of the fact that you, know, you don't worship on the first day of the week. You don't take the Lord's Supper like they did in the example of Acts 20, verse 7. Just start doing that and uh, baptize for the remission of sins because that's how one becomes a, that's the final step to become a Christian. And I kept saying those things, and in my mind, I think about that conversation some years ago, and in essence, all I was saying is, come on, keep coming, keep coming. And you realize if every person would simply do that, say, you know what, I'm going to take every creed and idea and name and thought that I believe, you covered that, and throw it all out. And just follow the Bible. You know what you'd have? Pure New Testament Christianity. You would have the Church of Christ. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? You've seen some of that beauty tonight. If you want to study more or know more about pure New Testament Christianity, you know, we, we think about that. If you love me, keep my commandments. Think about this world. The transgender movement. The LGBTQ2 plus S, whatever all that nonsense is. But, but friends, think about it. That all started even in the you know, 60s and 70s when people started having divorce for any reason. Matthew 19, 9 is just, is just as clear as, as Romans chapter 1. The point is you've got to get rid of all the baggage. And when you do, you can be a pure New Testament Christian and you can go to glory because of the way, the truth, the life, and the light. Brothers, thank you all so much for your good lesson. Lead us in a couple of verses of Lamb of God, and then we're, and then we'll be uh, closed in our prayer by one of our elders, Dink McDonald. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. I have been requested after this is over for the gospel preachers to work their way up here. We're going to take a picture for posterity's sake of the preachers who want to be in that picture a little bit after our service.